finances and money at the time. Uh, we start to head home, and before we'd gone to that game, I'd gotten an oil change, parked our cars, so we decided to drive all night because we couldn't wait to get home to tell our dad about our summer, okay? And we're, we're driving across the I-80, and my car would not go faster than 55 miles per hour. And I'm in a 1991 Honda Civic. I remember the payment was $161 a month. Uh, and this is summer of 2000. Yeah, I'm still paying on the car nine years later, right? Um, and my brother's in his 1987, I think it was a Cutlass Supreme. We called it the Golden Retriever. Um, and he's like, why can't you keep up? You know, because we had cell phones. We'd just gotten cell phones at that time. Uh, and, and I'm like, I don't know. My car won't go any faster. As I'm pulling into my parking spot at an apartment complex here in Provo, uh, you know, to stay with some friends, <laughs> my car seizes. Okay. The guy had not put the oil cap back on underneath after he changed my oil. Now, to highlight my ignorance in finances, I just passed the billboard that had Ron McBride on it and Lavelle Edwards that said, donate a kidney, you know, donate a car. I'm like, oh, I'll just donate my car and go buy a new one. <laughs> no big deal, right? It didn't matter to me. Like, I thought I'd made so much money. Of course, that money runs out fast. You guys all know that. Um, <laughs> so I went and bought, you know, everyone's dream car, a 1999 Forest Green Pontiac Grand Prix. Um, and that, that was, you know, that, that experience, the things that it taught me that I could be paid based on effort were such a foreign concept to me, okay? And I realized looking around that if somebody else can do something, I can do something. Like there was no limiting belief anymore in my life when it came to that. Uh, and, and I believed it and I did it. And it, eventually I transitioned into the next a guy in my apartment complex asked me, hey, how'd you do selling living scriptures? And I go, I killed it. I did so awesome. You know, like two months later, I find out that he had made $55,000 selling alarms. Much more humble than me, okay? And, um, and my first instant thought was, well, there's no way he, out, he worked harder than I did. There must be more money in that, right? You must be paid more for your effort. And... And I said, and I, you know, and I approached him and I go, you know, a few months later, I'm like, you really did this? He's like, yeah. And he was in the same area I was around Sacramento and Santa Rosa, um, California. Um, he had moved partway through the summer as well. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. And I find out that he started at one o'clock every day and not till about nine o'clock. And so I'm like, okay, well, it looks like I'm doing alarms. And sure enough, my first summer, I got married in 2001, uh, met my wife at Subway. She was a sandwich artist. <laughs> that's a joke um you know she was in line in front of me and and uh i was tired of the dating scene in provo at that time and uh saw her and i was going to ask her out and i thought no i'm tired of this i'm 25 years old got a, my second chance uh, when she was sitting outside on the lawn and she uh i approached her and i said well hey my name is lane and she immediately started laughing it was so uncomfortable. It was so awkward. <laughs> and I'm like, well, I'm this far. Hey, do you want to go out? Two nights later, we go out. And I found out that night. I took her to Olive Garden and uh, found out that she, that same day, two days before, she dropped off her boyfriend at the airport. He is, was leaving for Central America to do just a three-month humanitarian trip. And his name was Lane. <laughs> She'd never met another Lane. We were married before he got back. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I mean, it happened so fast. Another guy that she had dated previously called her on her way to the, the temple to ask her, to, hey, what are you doing? She had to explain to him. But anyways, um, so we get uh, the next summer. I get married that summer. The next, And I sold satellite dish around here door to door. Um, you know, when you're first married, you're so distracted with what you got going on there that, that you don't. Um, it's hard to focus on much else. And so we... Uh, went to Detroit, and sure enough, drove that Pontiac Grand Prix that you're all envious of uh, to Detroit to sell alarms my first summer. And um, I said, I'm committed. I'm doing it. If I work as hard, I bet I can make two or three times as much in alarms. And I went out and made $80,000. Mm -hmm. You know, and that was back before they had, you know, Shoney understands the lingo here, same-day installs. You know, we'd call in to have a, a job installed selling alarms, and the, the girls were like all of our wives there at the office, the apartment complex, and they'd say, great, 
you know, here it is April 30th. And they'd say, we have an opening on May 21st. We're like, love it. So we'd get it installed three weeks later. So needs to say you'd have a ton of cancels, but I still ended up installing about 215 that summer. Um, eventually, uh, that company split, um, and I went with a startup, which was a huge mistake. Uh, a company called, well, I won't say their name. Um, but, uh, and then I got reached out to by Todd and Keith over at Apex at that time. Um, had come off a bad summer and went over to Vivint and uh, they were willing to pay for any related attorney's fees or anything for switching to their company and they did it. They switched, of course I got sued, that's always fun. Um, and they paid for and covered everything and I was very grateful for that. And so I was committed to them all the way and uh, built a team in 2004, we went out, we killed it, our per rep average was, we did about two, just under 2,000 installs with about 16 reps. Um, out in Minnesota, um, I made over a couple hundred thousand dollars that summer, and it was just really, uh, it was incredible. You know, it launched my life. Eventually, as some of you know, Apex rebranded to Vivint. Um, I participated in their acquisition with several other guys at that level in 2012 when it sold to Blackstone Partners. Um, and, you know, I still have investments from that, that, uh, that transaction at this time and that. And so, the thing that pulled me away eventually to, to do real estate, which kind of leads into this, um, I left Vivint in about 2014, became the director of recruiting for Vivint Solar and for a couple of years. Uh, then I actually, like many of you, if you're an entrepreneur, you've had made many failings. I believe I heard Clay say that on his, you know, his podcast, but I've had many of those, tried a lot of different things and was coming off of failing when I um, got hired by Sprint to help them with their door-to-door -door, um partnership company and I realized that I wouldn't love it going into it because it was corporate because uh, I like autonomy I like freedom and uh, eventually I left uh, that after about eight months and they gave me a severance package and I studied to become a real estate agent and that's what transi transitioned into it and I would say that the thing that brought me into real estate because I wanted to do sales I wanted to continue was almost more than anything was I realized that real estate is relationship based. Although we call them transactions, they're not transactional relationships. Okay, they're not short term, they're long term. And that meant a lot to me to move into something that was more based on a long term type of relationship. And that's really what pulled me into real estate. So there we are. Is that too long? It's great, great introduction, and, and I think lays the foundation. Um, you know, I was in that industry as well, not as long as you, but seven seven years. And one of the uh, patterns that you've already kind of mentioned and brought out, which I just want to highlight this key piece, is you really uh, express how uh, I, I have this belief that life rewards effort, mm -hmm. right? And so the amount of energy that we put into something truly matters. And what you said was your commitment at the beginning. Right, your level of commitment that you had to the, the craft that you were working on is really what caused a lot of the success. And one of the things that I think is so important to, to ask ourselves when we're chasing a goal is to ask if we're interested in achieving that goal or are we truly committed to achieving that goal? And there's a difference in the two because being interested is means that you'll do it when it's convenient. It means, hey, I'm not gonna stay out till 10 o'clock at night because that's inconvenient, right? When you're truly committed, you'll do whatever it takes to accomplish a goal. That, that reminds me of that quote that uh, successful do, people do what other others aren't willing to do when they even when they don't feel like doing yeah. it. Yep, totally. So I just want to highlight that because that is, I think, one of the get, the key forces I've seen in many of the interviews that we've done is that there's a different level of, of commitment when it comes to achieving something. And, and I am curious a little bit about uh, the real estate. How did that uh, transition, maybe some of the principles that you took from that door-to-door -door space and you've actually applied it in your real estate business and that's also been a, a success uh, metric. Well, of course, effort is the first. Uh, you just, you know, uh, we're in a market, we're in a country, which is phenomenal because it rewards effort, right? The freedoms we have here are just truly amazing what it's built as far as the greatest economy in the history of the world. Um, and then uh, the focus on relationships mattered to me. I used to manage two to 300 sales reps every summer I'd recruit and train them on how to sell door to door. 
And I cherish and still have very long lasting relationships, especially with those managers. And many of them are incredibly successful in startups and business that they, that they have. And we stay in touch and we'll go eat lunch once in a while. And it's just uber uh, satisfying, you know, to between the effort and the relationships. Um, I will say that uh, as I was transitioning, one of the reasons also to back up a little bit that I came into real estate was because after leaving a startup thing I'd done previously that failed, um, I wanted to go into something that was proven and long lasting and would keep going. So real estate called my attention that way. And I started thinking about it more and something that's really important to me, and this will kind of segue into some other things I do involved with the community in that, was uh, I wanted to be able to be, it mattered to me to be able to make a difference in my work uh, and the hand in glove effect of real estate with being uh, a force for good in your community cannot be overstated. Okay, it is absolutely one and the same. It's the same direction. It, it all lines up. It makes, uh, there, there's no reason when you're coming from an altruistic standpoint that you can't be highly successful in real estate as well as in your community. Uh, as a matter of fact, you know, the founding fathers, there's a guy, an 18th century philosopher named John Locke. He, he wrote the uh, two treaties of government that many of our founding fathers uh, adhered to, and he was highly esteemed by Thomas Jefferson, by George Washington, by Benjamin Franklin. And he's the one that coined the phrase, the phrase, life, liberty, and the pursuit of. Hi, ah, I like those that inserted the correct one was not happiness. That was changed later, you know, by Thomas Jefferson. It's life, liberty, and the pursuit of ha uh, property, okay? Because property is something that just of the individual, private individual did not have that right, okay, to own and have property. In almost every other civilization previously, it belonged to the monarchs, okay? It belonged to the, the dictators. It belonged to those that um, were of, in their own minds, high of stature, right, and, and high birth. Whereas our country, the differentiator, it, it's property. Later, Thomas Jefferson changed it to happiness because he didn't want the connotation to be related to owning slaves, right, as far as property. Um, so that was... Those things right there, you know, mattered to me. Um, and I had started working with Follow the Flag before that. Um, and I can, if you want, I can give you that backstory a little bit of how I got involved there. But um, before I became and started studying to be a real estate agent, that was something that was preeminent in my mind was, holy cow, this, this country is incredible. And part of the reason I became a real estate agent was for that reason. And that is a great reason to become a real estate agent. Love it. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it is the key focus, which is relationship based. Like that's the game that we're in. We're in the business of people and relationships. And, um, you know, before we get into the, you know, some of the, the uh, organizations that you work with, I'm curious about every entrepreneur runs into roadblocks or challenges along the way of building a business. And so maybe walk us through some of the challenges that you ran into, you know, the last five to seven years as you've been building your, your business. Um, and yeah, just some of those roadblocks that you feel like you've faced, but you've been able to overcome. So the first thing that comes to mind is when we all become an agent, wow, there's a lot of uncertainty, right? And many of you are new here, um, but there's a whole lot of, uh, okay, I've changed careers. Do people, or are they going to look at me as a waffler? Right. I just switched into doing something like this or became that. I mean, if you guys are young, 22, 23 years old, well, kudos, keep it up. You know, you're right out the gate. That's who you are. Right. Um, but that was one of the biggest obstacles I had was in, in a book comes to mind. Stephen M. R. Covey's book, The, uh, the Speed of Trust. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, right here we can sum it up pretty quick. You know, there's comp, there's a integrity trust uh, and there's competency trust, two separate uh, kinds of trust. And that's what shaped kind of my beginning in this was I knew I had integrity trust with people who knew me, okay? Those who I'd worked with in the past, neighbors, friends, family, but I don't believe I had deserved competency trust, which is accurate and none of us have when we're first an agent. So that was one of my biggest obstacles. So I didn't bother anybody I knew almost for a year. Like I didn't even pay attention to my database. I'm not encouraging you to do that, but I felt like I hadn't earned that. Right. So I relied on my background of door to door sales and I just began knocking doors. Um, and in that first from May 1st, 2018, when I became a an agent to the end of that year, um, I had 
closed 14 transactions and 12 of them were related or 13 of them were related to knocking doors only. So I didn't. Mm -hmm. So what happened was when I did that the following January in 2019, I had five different people reach out to me that I knew had worked with in the past because I was a little bit more loud on social media that this was what I was doing. You cannot be ashamed about it. You just have to say, this is who I am. You have to be the fact of that commitment. You cannot let up. You have to go for it. And I did, and people started contacting me, and five people contacted me, like I said, to, to list seven different properties, uh, all people that were would be considered part of my SOI, right? And so I'm like, oh, wow, that's cool. And so by the end of my first year with those listings um, and other closings I had, I think the end the last month of my first full year in April of 2019, I think I had 11 closings. Mm -hmm. And those were all SOI closings. And then I started building the SOI, you know, and, and being better at the 36 touch and being better at doing events and doing all the things that you're trained, you know, in the first. Now, again, you can do that all at once. I did it that way, but I would highly encourage you doing it simultaneously. Um, but for me, that was it. I wanted to prove that I was competent. That was probably the biggest one. Yeah, I love it. And, and I think that's the reality of real estate is that we are in a trust based game. Like we have to be able to build. And I love that you separate the two. There's a lot of people who have a sphere of influence that believes that they have integrity. So they trust, right, that they're a good person. But to go a step further, how many people have had the situation where they look on Facebook or Instagram and they see their cousin or a family member or a friend who just bought a home or sold a home with another agent, right? And part of that comes to uh, how consistent we're staying in touch with that relationship. Are we consistently pouring into that relationship? The second piece, though, goes to asking the question of how competent do they believe that I am in this field, mm -hmm. right? They believe that I am the best person to help them navigate this process. And we have to kind of do an internal investigation of that. What am I, what touch points am I actually delivering to my database to ensure that I'm building credibility that I know this space? Right? And, and showing you to build on that, I think an important thing to recognize for each, is a, each of us here is that nobody owes us anything. Your best friend, your neighbor, your cousin, your mom, your dad, nobody owes you a thing. Sure, you can be the most honest person there is, but if you're not competent, they don't, they don't owe it to you. And even when you become competent, you still have to earn their business, right? Yeah. Love it. Love it. And, and that's kind of takes us to this next piece. I'd love to talk about uh, some of these organizations that you've been, um, you know, tied into and, and heavily supporting and maybe just talk about first. Uh, we've got follow the flag up here. And uh, Hunter, if you actually go to uh, back to the slides, there's a slide um, right underneath this. Keep going. Probably skip two ahead and then we'll come back to your logo as well. Um, for those of you, there are a good handful of you who went to the Follow the Flag event um, in July and was able to, to do this hike. Um, this is in Pleasant Grove. How many of you, by raise of hand, have, have seen this flag in Pleasant Grove? Okay, awesome. So uh, how many of you actually know the story behind it all? Okay, small handful. So this is going to be cool for you to be able to, to dive into this. Uh, but this was my first time doing the actual hike. I live like four blocks away from this, so I see it every year. I grew up in Pleasant Grove, so I always see it. Uh, but I didn't actually know the true meaning behind all of it and what it stands for. So like, maybe walk us through a little bit uh, around Follow the Flag. So Kyle Fox is the founder. He's been here before a couple years ago, I believe. But um, And then Ron Nix is a founder as well, as well. Ron was a good friend of mine. We had done, um, back when the church did scouting, uh, they did wood badge, right? And we've done a course like that together. Uh, it's actually a pretty great course for leadership training. Um, and Ron had said to me, hey, we're going to be hanging the flag again in the canyon. And at that time, they'd hung in 2015 and 2016 the 30 by 60 foot flag that you see like in Macy's, okay, that same size flag. And he goes, this year we got a surprise coming. He goes, you need to come to the meeting because I got an eagle project for your son. And my son had, was, had just turned 14. And I'm like, Okay, sure, I'm not going to find anything for him to do, so why not? Um, I saw on Facebook that I would missed the first meeting they had held at Chubby's in Pleasant Grove. And I was like, shoot, so I reached out to Ron. I'm like, hey, you still got an Eagle project he can do? He goes, yeah, he's going to be in charge of rigging and retrieving the flag. And I'm like, that sounds awesome. I have no idea what that means, right? Well, I'm not kidding. 900 hours later, my son had an Eagle project done. Um, but it was the first giant flag uh, giant being that it's a quarter acre, it's 11,700 square feet. It was the first time we'd hung the large flag and it was so much work to get that thing 
Eventually, if you go to ftf.org, you'll see a video that shows how we used to heave hold the, the line across the canyon to be able to, you know, you'd have 3,000 poles and everybody's hands would be blistered. Uh, eventually, um, Utah County Search and Rescue got involved and looked at us like we were crazy, like you couldn't believe no one had died, and also how incompetent we were because of our rigging abilities. But um, it captured my son's imagination and his attention so much at the age of 14. He felt so proud. He felt like he had been involved in something so important that it actually pulled in our whole family. And now, you know, we make the trips to help him rig and retrieve the flag in Snow Canyon and in Twin Falls. And, um, you know, they called North Ogden when Mayor Brent Taylor passed away. Uh, they called us to have us come put it up there. Uh, and so, it, you know, the mission of Follow the Flag is to honor, heal, and inspire. And I just do what I can for the organization. And it's not like there's like this high-minded level or board or anything, right? It's just the grunt work's the grunt work. When people call, you know, we get our kids together. Somebody says, hey, my husband just um, committed suicide. It's terrible. But he's a, he's a veteran. Could you guys honor him? And we'll bring our flags over to wherever they're holding the, the uh, and, and put them in the ground. And, um, you know, and it obviously it brings a sense of community uh, for the you know to everyone as far as togetherness and unity but for our family as well well it's just been super powerful to to bring us back to you know the blessings that we have for living where we live love it and and why i'm um, having you speak about uh, some of these organizations that you work with you've over the last uh, five years so just from 2020 you've closed 225 transactions 106 a little over 106 million dollars in sales volume and i've been a student of successful people yeah give them a hand for that that's that's phenomenal um, there's uh, sometimes a lot of teams that don't do that uh, over that time period. So uh, a huge achievement. And uh, I've been a student of successful people, Ed Milet, Tony Robbins, Gary Keller. And what I found is uh, they all live by the same principle uh, that's taught by Zig Ziglar. And it says that you can have everything in life that you want if you will just help enough other people get what they want. And I've noticed that you've been heavily involved uh, with BNI. You've been heavily involved with different organizations to, to be able to give back. And it's not actually real estate focused. But the funny you know, uh, uh, thought process that I have is I believe that you probably get a lot of like selling real estate is a byproduct of how well you serve and show up for other people. Um, Hunter's actually going to pull up the Follow the Flag website. And uh, we have a little video to, to roll with this um, to give a little bit more in-depth insight into Follow the Flag. It's a great big flag and it's beautiful. But I just can't wait to see it flutter in the breeze the first time. They just want everybody to remember what the flag means, what it should mean. They're really great people. They're doing things for this random kid whose father got killed fighting for his country. It's bringing community together and there's a buzz about it. Basically, like that felt like the state of Utah was driving up the driveway with us. It's amazing to me that so many people would come together to do this. It really has taken on a life of its own. We, we literally now at this point, we're trying to like hold the reins on this. The community involvement, all the youth that are involved. Four score and seven years ago. People are just getting around it, and it's becoming more and more of a huge patriotic symbol. A special environment to be in. Some people have called it hallowed. It's what's behind the flag and what the meaning is in those colors and in those stars. So you're deeply involved uh, with not only follow the flag but also you support uh, Dahlia's Hope. And um, I really want to just kind of tie into how important it is to focus on building relationships, right? This topic of the conversation today is how to win friends and influence people. And I really believe it comes from service, right? How we show up. Um, and and it, it all has real estate being an end byproduct, right? How well we, sh we show up and support our clients, uh, our community, the people that we care about uh, ends up allowing us to do business at a higher level. But maybe walk us through as well uh, Dahlia's Hope and what this organization stands for. So a counterintuitive point to a lot of our businesses is if things aren't going well, it's go back to your one thing and start lead generating. In my business, when things aren't going well, I have to stop and I think, you know what, I need to get more involved with Dahlia's Hope and follow the flag. 
and eventually the invisible hand manifests itself in my business. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's almost more reliable than anything else I do mm. when I truly dig in and start doing that. Now, Dahlia's Hope, um, I currently serve. I've been on the board since it was founded. Uh, we just passed year five, five years ago. A year ago, I was installed as, voted in as chairman of the board. Um, and this is an absolute miraculous beginning. And it's right there. We provide complete aftercare for sex trafficking survivors. And it is a heavy, heavy thing. You know, some of you are here when Faith, who's right there on the cover, was here along with Sherston. Sherston happens to be my cousin. She was the uh, director of development for OUR for several years. Um, she had to move on because she had two young kids and wanted to raise them. And every time she'd leave, Tim would pay her more money. Um, but finally, she broke away, and shortly after she does, she gets a call from Tim saying, hey, can you please meet me at Deer Valley for a fundraising event? I have someone I need you to meet. Faith here had uh, escaped from her captors in New York, and this was the second time that it happened. And she uh, basically was believed by a female detective in New York, uh, her story. And she became, I'm skipping a lot of, context here, but to speed this along, she became the key witness in the largest uh, sex trafficking ring breakup in the history of the state of New York, okay? Um, she would face her captors. Here she is. She's no taller than four feet, six inches, okay? Um, and But she is a powerful, powerful person. Fast forward, Tim introduces her to Matt. Uh, Matt is Sherston's husband and to Sherston, my cousin, and they, uh, he asked him, can you please figure out a place for her to live? Because the detective had called him and said, hey, I don't, we don't know what to do with her. Because she's over, once you're 18, there's no place to put these, these victims, okay, these survivors. And so they take her in for a couple months until a family in their neighborhood becomes empty nesters. They take her in. One morning, Faith wakes up and runs over to Sherston's house and said, I had a dream. And in my dream, I was helping my sisters, her sisters being other survivors, or, you know, not even survivors yet, but women who were still captive, okay, that she had gone through all that. And I, you know, I, this is tough to take, but they're abused about 30 to 40 times a day, okay? Um, and she had this dream that she was helping her sisters, that she was helping them weed a garden, that she had a place for them to stay, that they were, they, she was helping train them. Um, and my cousin's like, great, I just left OUR, but this seems like a call to action. Um, and she calls me and she's like, hey, Lane, this has happened. Um, can you please help us? And I happen to have a good connection with the CEO of the Sterling Foundation, Sterling being the founders of doTERRA. Mm -hmm. um, and he was a neighbor and a good friend of mine. And uh, they, after vetting us for months, eight months, they gave us our first $130,000 to really get things going. Um, so now we have a, in Highland, we have a farm. Some of you have been there. We should do another, uh, mm -hmm service day there if any of you want to go do that. Would any, any of you want to go do that, work on that farm? It's always needs upkeep, upkeeping and, uh, you know, and that, but we'd love to have your help any way we can get it. If any of your teams want to go do that or you want to go do that and invite your clients, you're welcome to, and, you know, go work at it. Um, there's always something to do. We have now, we have a cuddle cow. That is a real thing. The cow actually comes up and will cuddle you. <laughs> um, and what, what's you know, the walk us through the purpose of that farm? What was that? So the for? farm, the working with animals and working with the earth are actually incredibly therapeutic and key for helping people recover from, from trauma experiences. Okay, and we have a house there as well, a transition house they can live in, um, and it's it, the animals they regain that empathy which was not shown to them for for many years, and they're able to to uh, essentially become less numb because you grow numb, as you can imagine. I can't imagine it um, when that's happening to you. And so that has, you know, we just were able to get rezoned. So we're able to put in a, um, an equine therapy uh, arena that we'll have there on that property. Um, and we operate our operating budgets about $1.2 million. We can do a lot more, even if we bump that up to 1.5. We have our annual gala each year on, uh, this year it's on October 24th in downtown Salt Lake. If any of you want to come and purchase a table and be there, we'd love it. Um, but it's, it's uh, the effect community-wise, uh, it's been incredibly positive. It's, it's neat to be able to meet with city planners and different people. Um, 
and they love what we're doing. We live in an incredibly charitable area of the world, and we're fortunate you know, to be able to see what's growing. Pleasant Grove a year ago declared July 19th our, on our fourth anniversary, uh, Dahlia's Hope Day. Mm. So well, That's awesome. Um, Hunter, we're going to tee up another video from Dahlia's Hope. And uh, I, I really, after we watch the video, Lane, if you'll just kind of share, I, I feel like there's, and we have it on this wall over here, there's the six personal perspectives at Keller Williams. And number three is moving from E to P. So uh, a lot of entrepreneurs try to build a business based off of grit. Right. I'm going to just put in the most hours. Uh, but there's a transitional phase where you have to realize that everybody has a limit, which is actually their hours. Right. We have to get far more purposeful with how we build our business, whether that's through tools, systems, people, uh, or in this case, even leveraging, uh, you know, how we're supporting the community. Right. And saying, I'm going to build trust through service and through impact. So maybe just share uh, how your business has shifted more to an entrepreneur from entrepreneur to purposeful. Right. You're door knocking from the beginning. And now you're far more purposeful with how you're building relationships. B and I, obviously, these, these charitable uh, groups as well that really go a, a lot further than your initial phase. So, so rather than play that video, because I know we're low on time, let, let's not play that. But to answer your question, um, I think that part of my experience in door to door was so transactional, and it 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 bled from the doors all the way up through the entire organization, and it doesn't. The, the a lot of times for me the uh, the relationships weren't authentic and as real as they could be. So it drove me really far the other way um, to want to be more relationship focused. Mm. And so now, uh, you know, and I'm not saying it's all shallow and it's not great in door to door because there's a lot of, I mean, it, it, there's so much to learn from that business that is absolutely applicable and very good. Um, but for me, it drove me clear over here to where all that mattered to me was was the relationship part of it. Like I wanted to be around people who wanted to be around me and me, them, who had similar ideals and similar, similar ways of viewing the world yeah. and making a difference. And so like when I got involved with BNI, matter of fact, I think it was Becca Summers that posted over, this is five and a half years ago or so, so in the, in the KW agent chat or the page on Facebook, hey, there's an opening in the X Factor chapter of BNI at Thanksgiving Point. I had no idea what any of those words meant. You know, the following Monday, Steve McMurtry, I think, you know, who's here is, says, hey, you ought to apply for that chapter. I'm applying for it. We ought to go for it. And I'm like, dude, you're speaking a foreign language to me. And I went online and looked up what it was. Um, and BNI means Business Networking International. But the whole mantra of BNI is giver's gain. And I'm like, okay, that's cool. That's something I could get behind. I went to the meeting the following day. Nobody had invited me, you know, from the chapter. I showed up and there's like 11 other realtors in there. I'm like, what is going on? Like, what is this? I don't understand a thing that's happening here. But all these people want to be, you know, part of it. And they'd stand up and talk about how many transactions they did. And I thought there's no way I would get the seat because I was still, you know, a year into the business. Um, and and uh, <laughs> that I learned later that that day they were going to pick somebody that they had interviewed, but they decided to extend it about three more weeks. Um, and I started bringing, before I was a member of the chapter, I started giving people referrals, I started bringing visitors, I started bringing value, okay, before I was even part of it. Um, and fortunately, they picked me. And my first year, I think I received one referral while I was in it, but in, in my first eight months, and I'd given $140,000 worth of business that people went into other people's pockets in the chapter from their businesses. By the end of my first year, I'd given over a quarter million, and then all of a sudden, the second week of my first year, I got five referrals from other members of the chapter, um, which all closed. Now, you guys do the ROI on that. You know what you get paid per deal. Um, and that I was like, holy cow. Because I had committed and I paid two years up front to be part of it, I, was, I committed never to look back. There it is again, right? I made that commitment. And I was like, I'm going to go do what all this requires. I was always at the top of the board on referrals, on money, you know, closed business given to other people. Uh, CEUs, you name it. I was at the top, you know, most one-to-ones, whatever they, the metrics they use in BNI, and and I learned that, you know, of course, givers gain. It came back to me, and my goal in there is to, and it still is to this day, to always give twice as much as I've given, and I've given about two and a half million in business to other businesses, and I'm almost right at half that earned over that same period of time. Wow. Yeah, and I will highlight this as kind of our wrapping up point because one of the things I've recognized is you and I have had many of conversations 
about how you're growing your business and some of the goals that you have, one of the things that I've realized is uh, we have to be very focused on depositing more than we withdraw yeah. when it comes to relationships. Okay, think about it uh, is relationship banking. Uh, when you go to a bank that you don't have a relationship with, that you haven't made any deposits with, and you say, I want to withdraw $100,000, you've got to know they're going to tell you no because you haven't made the deposits and you don't have a relationship with them. And actual relationships are the same way. We have to look at how much can I deposit up front before I ever try to withdraw and help serve them when it comes to buying, selling, or investing. And uh, it goes back to that idea. There's a quote by Jim Rohn. It says, the more you give, the more you receive. It's, it's a universal law. And that's probably the overarching theme that I've heard uh, from you today, Lane, and I appreciate you uh, being willing to come on. Is there anything else that you'd like to share with this group that are chasing their goals and really going after it when it comes to building a big life? Anything else, uh, recommendation that you'd like to provide? Uh, there's another Jim Rohn quote that really I like a lot, and it has to do with personal growth. And it essentially, and if I, if I beat it up a little bit, please forgive me, Ruth, says, I will take care of me for you if you take care of you for me. So in other words, it comes back to personal improvement and trying to become better. You know, growth is not an option. Growth isn't an, a small window. It's a nonstop ongoing thing. And, you know, seek for that, those uncomfortable spots. Love it. Thank you. Yeah. Give them a hand.